Howdy Howlers, it's Sako Toomey, also known as Caspoit, and today we're going to be reading through Basic Witches by Jaya Saxena and Jess Zimmerman. All right, so good to see you, Christina. Hope you had a happy holiday. It seemed like you really did. And Ginny, oh, my eyebrows are just not having it today. Oh my God, it's terrible. I will give it a few more minutes for people to mill in because I didn't exactly have it like premeditated. I like, I woke up at 9.30 and so here we are. Uh, good morning to everybody. Oh my goodness. It's good to see you guys. And I'm going to have a special surprise for you guys, like, soon. Yes. It will be soon. I need to make the things first. I have plans. I have grandiose plans of stuff I'm going to make for you guys. My thing is crooked. Tonster in the house, been up since nine ish. Here we go. Nice and straight. Really did. So this year when I'm so glad we are ending 2020 on a positive note. Yeah, I hope your holiday were awesome too. It, it was busy. It was, it was nice but I needed to recover from it. The party has arrived, hi Tani. Ginny's been up since four, went to work, came home. Now not sure what I'm gonna do other than hang out here for a bit. Oh. I know those feels. Yesterday I had a friend visit. He wanted to make sure that our friendship was still okay, <laughs> which of course it was. Of course it was. Mm. Do, 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 do. Sorry, I'm kind of zoning out a little bit. And I know some people actually watch this in the replay, so maybe I should watch out for how much like dead space I do. Uh, I can't seem to get my mic to work, which it won't detect it for some reason. just now getting to cleaning up after the festivities and it's it's a lot and besides dishes yeah those are essential yeah i get you A spell of yes and no. This visualization focuses your mind on the innate elemental power we all exercise when saying yes and saying no. 
What you'll need is a quiet room or outdoor space, a full bathtub, sink, glass, or natural body of water, and a candle. Your yes and no are already powerful. Even leaving aside everything that they can do for you outside of the bedroom, they're the only thing, not someone else's feelings, not what you should do, not what everyone else is doing, that should determine what kind of sex you have and when and with whom. Yay, I'm glad we can keep you company. Sit or lie in a comfortable position. Close your eyes and concentrate on your heartbeat. Picture yourself as an immovable wall with a door set in it that only you can open and close. When you are ready, say these words. In earth, in water, in air, in fire, I am the master of my desire. As you say the incantation, picture a ball of green light and energy collecting around your right hand and a ball of red light and energy around your left. Raise your right hand and say aloud, yes. Picture the green light shooting forth and emitting waves of pressure in the air. Raise your right left hand and say aloud, no. Picture the red light doing the same. Touch your right hand to the floor or ground and say aloud, yes. Picture the green light shaking the earth like a tiny quake. Touch your left hand to the floor or ground and say no. Picture the red light doing the same. Repeat the incantation, focusing on the water as you say yes and no. Imagine the surface rippling like a glass of water, like the glass of water in Jurassic Park. <clears throat> Repeat the incantation again, focusing on the candle and imagine it guttering and flickering in response to the power of your yes and no. Say your incantation once again and picture the red and green lights receding from your hands into your body where it will stay until you need to use it. <clears throat> Which was a kind of a weird one for me. Kind of a weird one. All right, choosing the right broomstick for you. Mind you, broomstick is like in quotes. The image of a witch riding a broomstick has a secret meaning, which is pretty obvious when you think about it. A woman straddling a long, hard object is a threat, not just because she can spit on you from the sky. She's a threat because she's straddling a long, hard object. Modern Western society is still generally uncomfortable with masturbation. So imagine how uncomfortable we were in the days when the dominant culture was so strongly religious that witch hunts were considered a social good. For many, the idea that a witch could feel complete by herself without a man was shocking and shameful. Honestly, for many, it still is. The broomstick symbolized the heretical act of a woman taking physical pleasure into literally her own hands. The witch on her broomstick is proud, not ashamed of her body, and she doesn't need to ask permission to tap into her sexuality. Orgasms are a serious big time magic. It's no coincidence that many occult traditions incorporate sex rituals. And some occult scholars even believe that you can harness orgasmic energy and use it like a battery. And the witch wields that power all on her own. Of course, toys, a broomstick or an easily clean silicone equivalent can be used with a partner. But you can use them alone if you don't have a partner, if your partner isn't around, if you're tapping into the power of orgasm for practical spell, if you really want to freak out a Puritan, 
or for whatever reason you like. You don't know for sure which sex toys will work for you until you try them out. And many are too expensive for comparison shopping. Figuring out what sensations you like can help you narrow down your options. All of these can be used regardless of your anatomy, though some may be better suited with to people with a vagina. We're omitting toys that are designed to penetrate designed to be penetrated, both because those aren't universally useful and because the broomstick metaphor has to be good for something. The elfin wand. Some people want a lot of control over where they direct sensations. A small vibrator is perfect for this, and some can be strapped onto your finger so you don't have to worry about hanging on to something small and fiddly. If you have a vagina and also enjoy penetration, many penetrative vibrators have a little external prong that delivers focused vibration, though it's hard to deliver direct when than smaller non-penetrative non-penetrative options. For extra control, choose a vibe with multiple speed settings. The Thunder Goddess. If you prefer a more distributed, strong vibration, which covers more ground but is less easily directed, you may want a vibrating wand with a large head. These aren't designed for penetration, but can be used in combination with a G-spot prostate toy. G-spot or prostate tro toy, yeah. They're great for people who find very focused sensations distracting or even painful. Try to find one with multiple speeds because the really powerful wands are, well, really powerful. Vulva havers who have a hard time reaching orgasm report that the classic Hitachi magic wand can work wonders, but some feel that the Hitachi vibrations are too strong to be sexy. The Devil's Finger. Though G-spot for vagina havers or prostate for prostate havers, Stimulation doesn't always lead directly to orgasm. It can significantly enhance your experience. Every body is different, so figure out where your spot is manually before you go shopping so you can get a toy with the right proportions. Pay attention to what kind of stimulation does the trick for you. Some toys with targeted penetration also vibrate and others don't. You may find that the vibration is key or that it's too weak or prefer a toy that is rubbed or rocked against the target spot. Or if nothing but an actual literal enchanted flying machine will suit your needs, you can do what historical witches reportedly did, ask for help from demons. Witch history, the origins of the magic broomstick. Popular images of witches depict them soaring through the sky on broomsticks to terrorize innocent townspeople or play Quidditch. But if a witch is powerful enough to fly on her own, why the arbitrary accessory? Just where did the broomstick come from? The answer boils down to two major themes of paranoia, drugs and sex. Humans have long experimented with hallucinogenic plants. As John Mann writes in Murder, Magic, and Medicine, humans discovered in medieval times not only that eating things like deadly nightshade and mandrake may make you intensely nauseated, but also absorbing them through the skin, especially the thinner mucous membranes, produced effects that are significantly trippier. Psychedelic self-medication figured in some of the earliest accounts of witches with brooms. In 1324, an investigation of Lady Alice Kitteler for witchcraft produced a pipe of ointment wherewith, wherewith she greased a staff upon which she ambled and galloped through the thick and thin, according to Robert C. Fuller's In Stairways to Heaven, Drugs in American Religious History. Brooms were a handy way to get that ointment flowing through your body. 
However, the notion of witches flying on broomsticks didn't come for another 300 years or so. Between 1668 and 1667, hundreds of women in Sweden were accused of stealing children on the Sabbath to worship the devil. According to the child witnesses, the women would make their escape by flying on poles. Reports of these Swedish trials went the 17th century equivalent of viral. Soon after, the Puritan townspeople of Salem, Massachusetts began to accuse witches of flying, which the witches themselves co corroborated. In farther account of the trials of the New England witches, minister and witch hunter Cotton Mather wrote that, the, that one Martha Carrier confessed that the devil carried them on a pole. Other members of Carrier's family were charged with flying, and according to another account cited in St Stacy Schiff's The Witches, nearly 70 witches descended on a meadow flying on various poles. By 1711, poles had given way to classic witchy brooms. In his history of the ridiculous extravagancies of Monsieur Offleu, uh, published that year, the French abbot and philosopher Laurent Bordelon box at the supposed power of witches. What probably is there that as often as a silly old woman is pleased to mutter two or three words out of the grimoire or black book or and clap a broom betwixt her legs, that Satan should be obliged to transport her through the chimney where she pleases? Good question. Although we can't be sure what prompted the switch from pole to the broom in the popular imagination of the witch-fearing public, there are a few theories about the connection between unruly women and sweeping implements. Jumping on brooms was part of the pagan planting rituals, and a broom may have seemed like a suspicious convenient place for a witch to conceal a wand. Pretty much every pre-industrial woman had a broom after all. It would be a great hiding spot. Regardless of the origins of the association, some modern day w Wiccans have chosen to incorporate brooms into their non-transport related magical work, especially and fittingly for spells of cleansing and purification because nothing is more magical than chores. Saying magic words in bed. Now, talking during sex has been something that took me a long time to learn. Um, to say, like, whether I enjoyed something or didn't enjoy something. Um, I would say that was within the last three years. We talk a lot in this book about the power of speaking your goals and desires aloud, and no, nowhere is this power more important than in the bedroom. But that doesn't make verbalizing during intimacy easy. We may absorb the idea that good girls don't talk about naughty things, or that only pushy women ask for it, what they want. Such fast-acting incantations may take a little practice. Here are a few topics of bedroom communication and some magic words you can practice saying to get the conversation going. <clears throat> Pleasure. What feels good is the most obvious topic to talk about when you're engaged in an activity that's supposed to make both of you feel good. Because bodies are so varied and what feels pleasurable to someone else might not suit you. Communication is the only way to have truly satisfying sex. You don't have to jump right to graduate level dirty talk, but practicing a few key phrases will help you feel more confident directing the action. Magic words would be 
I want you, that feels good, faster or slower, or you get the idea. I know vocalize, I know and vocalize before and after what I like and don't like, but I have one hell of a time vocalizing anything during. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a challenge. It takes a lot of practice. <clears throat> there are also times where I am not capable of words, in which case he's doing something right. Sexy talk is not one of my strong suits. I used, I used my awkward charm to seduce my husband and it works, but <laughs> my prowess or a little or lack thereof has never been a problem to communicate. We have a safe space to mutually communicate our needs. That's awesome. Um, there was a thing about, um, tw uh, Tumblr before it, I too got involved. I get, I'm too involved with the sensations during to do anything with talking. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a challenge. I don't remember what I was saying. It's fine. All right. Pain. Women are often taught to be polite about sex, and sometimes in intimate situations, we avoid speaking up about discomfort that keeps us from fully enjoying ourselves. Maybe your partner is leaning on you painfully, or you're falling off the bed, or you don't think about, you don't think having your boob honked is sexy, but you think mentioning it would ruin the moment. We promise it won't. You never have to put up with unpleasantness, pain, or even minor discomfort just to avoid awkwardness. <clears throat> Magic words being, can you move a little? That hurts. Don't do that. Gentler, please. Mercy. Mer <laughs> that is a word that I have used. <clears throat> Contraception and STI prevention. We don't have to tell you how important it is to use protection during sex, but we can give you permission to be really annoying about it if you want to be, even if it, if doing so is awkward, even if it ruins the moment, even if it gets on people's nerves. Insist on a condom if you want to, even if you're already on the pill or have an IUD. If you can get pregnant, don't hesitate to tell the partner who can get people pregnant your views on abortion before anything goes down. <clears throat> and if your method of protection isn't working for you, you can and should stick up for yourself, both with partners and with medical professionals. Recent research has shown that hormonal birth control is linked with depression in a way doctors have long ignored, and there are other side effects that doctors may not take seriously. Put your foot down if you need to. Magic words were, when were you last tested? You'll need a condom. These side effects are not okay with me and I need an alternative. <clears throat> A spell for talking about sex. Oh. It's never too late to be safe. Stick up for your reproductive health. Absolutely. <clears throat> this spell will help you admit your wants and needs to yourself and verbalize any dormant feeling you may have. What you'll need is a white candle, matches, or a lighter time, fresh or dried, and a small red envelope. <clears throat> Once, Jaya hired a witch to cast a spell on her marriage. On Etsy, you can find no shortage of self-described witches promising to make someone love you or offering to hex your ex. So after blithely sending her full name and birthday to a stranger on the internet, please don't do this, 
Jaya received confirmation of the spell a week later. Photos of her and her husband's names written on a red envelope full of herbs as it was burned over a candle, presumably with a witch behind the camera chanting for the magical sex they would soon be having. So, did it work? Uh, sort of. After the spell was cast, Jaya felt a palpable sexual energy. She didn't tell her husband what she had done, and their interactions were great. But around the same time, they both caught a horrible stomach virus. To avoid any adverse re results, we recommend this at-home version of the spell. Try doing it on a Tuesday or a Friday. Tuesday is ruled by Mars, who rules over sex and lust, and Friday is by Venus, who rules over love and passion. <clears throat> Light the candle and sit in front of it, and take a moment to focus on the flame. Then hold the time between your fingers and in front of your face. Start rubbing the time in your fingers, enough so that you begin to smell, so, smell it strongly. Once the herb releases its scent, rub it on the center of your forehead, your lips, and your chest. Breathe deeply and picture twin paths of light traveling from your head and your heart to your lips. With every breath, imagine those paths growing brighter and stronger, drawing your thoughts and feelings out of your brain and heart and toward your mouth. Breathe this way until you feel the connections getting stronger. Then place the remaining time in the envelope and carry it with you for at least a week. When you find yourself thinking of sex, hold the envelope in your hands, remembering those paths to your mouth to encourage your thoughts and feelings to, smooth, to flow smoothly. That I don't know. Witch history, witches, and reproductive freedom. I have no coffee. I might take a moment to get some coffee. I'm gonna get some coffee. I'm gonna get some coffee. Boop boop. Oh, my foot's asleep.
All right, I'm back, I swear. Yes, coffee break. Excellent. Oh, I hope my husband helps me with my sides today. I always play upbeat elevator music in my head when the please stand by sign is up. <laughs> yeah. I actually am thinking about making a, a, a like a please stand by video that lasts about five minutes because it doesn't take me that long to make a cup of coffee. <clears throat> Be right back. I spilled creamer. Aww. I want you to take a sip of it now, but I know it is too hot. Oh, my ears. Witches, history, witches, and productive freedom, reproductive freedom. Witches and reproductive freedom. In 1484, Innocent the Eighth issued a pa a papal 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 bull authorizing church inquisitors to investigate claims of witchcraft. The bull was written at the request of Inquisitor Heinrich Kramer, who would go on to co-write the Malleus Maleficarum, the explicitly misogynistic witch-hunting guide. Kramer believes there had been an outbreak of witchcraft in Germany and wanted permission to persecute it to the fullest extent of his power. The Papal Bull granted that permission. It officially recognized the ex existence of witches and described their crimes, some of which it explicitly related to sex, abortion, and contraception. Witches have slain infants yet in the mother's womb, and they hinder men from performing the sexual act and women from conceiving. The Malleus Maleficarum talks about the witches preventing conception and causing abortions, or when those failed, eating babies or offering them to the devil. The authors recognize that not all contraception is witch-induced. A man can be natural can by natural means such as herbs procure that a woman cannot generate or conceive. When a woman does it, though, there's something real suspicious about that. I heard reproduction in my head and heard the song Reproduction from Greece 2. Can't say as I know it. As John M. Riddle writes in Eve's Herbs, a history of contraception and abortion in the West. Women have been finding ways to limit childbearing since basically the dawn of civilization. Often they use brute force, either by blocking the cervix to prevent impregnation with a device similar to a modern diaphragm made of wool or bamboo, or another material in pre-industrial society, or by inducing miscarriage through physical exertion or applying pressure to the abdomen. Ancient Egyptians made a kind of contraception sponge made of honey, dates, plant matter, and acacia gum, which breaks down into lactic acid, an ingredient used in modern spermicide. In ancient Greece, a midwife might have administered sil sylphium, a fennel-like herb that was so effective on aborfacent Abortifacient, that, that's a hell of a word, Jesus. 
schoolhouse rock styles education. Yeah, no kidding. Mm. Still too hot. It's stuck in my head now and I have to share the madness. I will watch it later. Uh, let's see. That demand for its use may have led to its extinction. Herbs like Pennyroyal and Queen's and Queen Anne's lace are still occasionally used to induce abortion today, and they are neither safe nor reliable. None of these contraceptive methods require actual magical power, of course. They're just science, folklore, or often a little of both. But for, for the Catholic Church and its agents, women controlling their reproductive, their reproduction was inherently devilish. By assigning malign motives to contraception and abortion, they condemned women's bodily autonomy. Well, fine. If birth control and abortion are witchcraft, then all women and all people with uteruses should get to be witches. Eating babies is a problem, but otherwise we get complete control over what we do with our wombs and no inquisitor can tell us otherwise. A spell to feel sexually powerful. This is not a spell to create sexual attraction, but rather to make you feel more in touch with your sexuality. If others pick up on that, well, that's just a great bonus. What you'll need is an outfit that makes you feel powerful, which is optional, a bathroom or wall mirror, a plush blanket, a red candle, and something to set fire to said candle. First, put on your outfit. Alternatively, be naked. This and most spells work great when performed unclothed. Next, look at yourself in the mirror. Pose, move, maybe take a selfie or two. Whatever it takes to make you, it, whatever it takes for you to recognize your body and start enjoying what you see. Then lay the blanket on the floor and light the candle. Lie down on the blanket and place the candle on the floor just above your head. Make sure it's in a candle holder or other sturdy base to keep it from falling over. You're, close your eyes, keeping the image of yourself in the mirror on your mind's eye. Start moving your hands up and down your body, being aware of every inch of your skin and how it feels against the fabric and the blanket. Then let your mind drift to your sexual desires. If you don't know what you desire, use your imagination to put yourself in different sexual situations. How does it feel? What do you find that interests you? Breathe deeply as your body starts to feel warmer. When you're ready, recite the following three times. My body is fire and I am deserving of all my desires. Slowly get up and blow out the candle. Sleep under that blanket that night. A spell for healing a broken heart. This spell reenacts the experience of letting someone deeper and deeper into your heart and then helps you close the exit wound gently, bit by bit. What you'll need is a picture or a drawing of your former beloved, a jar, a rose, and scissors. That sounds like you are binding your love, binding your ex. That is... That is nefarious. Heartbreak is so agonizing because it infiltrates every part of your life. You reevaluate your opinion of yourself. Are you less worthy and lovable than you thought? You are forced to reimagine your days. All the time you used to spend with someone feels empty and meaningless. You let go of all your visions of what your future would be like and face the void of a life without the other person. 
it destabilizes your daily life, your confidence, your plans, and your sense of identity. A centering ritual can be the first step to reclaiming that stability. Sit on the floor or ground in a quiet secluded space with little or no breeze. Lean forward and place the picture on the ground as far away from you as you can reach. Place the jar at your side. Pluck the outer petals off the rose and lay them around you in a semicircle with at least a foot of space between the petals and your body. Move the picture just inside the semicircle. Pluck the next layer of petals of the rose off the rose and lay them around you in a semicircle closer to you than the previous semicircle. Move the picture just inside this new semicircle. Repeat once more, making a third semicircle and placing the picture right in front of you. Hold the heart of the rose between your hands close to your heart and concentrate on all the qualities you possess that have nothing to do with the person that you lost. What do you love doing by yourself? What are you like when they're not around? What essential qualities are inherent to you and unchanged by your heartbreak? Place the heart of the rose in the jar. Mm. Collect the petals from the innermost circle and move the picture to inside the second semicircle. As you pick up the petals, think about the positive aspects of having your life, <clears throat> your living space to yourself, exactly by the exactly the way you want it. <clears throat> Put the petals in the jar. Collect the petals from the next semicircle and move the picture to just inside the final semicircle. As you pick up the petals, think about the strongest parts of your social life with out your formal flame, spending time with friends, clubs you belong to, and activities you like to do on your own. Put the petals in the jar. Collect the petals from the outermost circle, and again, place the picture as far away as you can reach. As you pick up the petals, think about the positive plans for the future you do not involve the person you've lost. Do you have a trip coming up? Or can you plan a solo journey in the near future? Are you poised for a success in work or school? Put the petals in the jar. With the scissors, cut the picture into three parts and bury it in the ground, hmm, in a flower pot or in a trash can. Keep the jar of petals until you feel stronger and then scatter the dried petals in a place where that is meant in a place that is meaningful to you where your former beloved has never set foot. So it's not a binding, it's quite the opposite. You're binding the love. And it sounds like you're binding the, the love for yourself, the, the love of being single. Bidink a dink. Oh, geez. I will have to watch it later. So next is the banishment chapter, the powers to avoid what brings you down. Fairy tales paint witches as consorts of the devil, vengeful agents of chaos intent on ruining the lives of those who cross them or those who don't if the mood strikes with devilish magic. But in those stories, the witch is hardly the hero. Her adversaries always win. From Medusa to the Wicked Witch of the West, many, fictional the, many a fictional witch has met her end thanks to a mob of townspeople, a heroic prince, an innocent princess, or even her own demonic sidekick. 
These days, we're more likely to face down a metaphorical adversary than a literal one. Demons wield pointy, emotional pitchforks awry. Uh, can't read today, I swear. Demons wielding pointy, emotional pitchforks arrive at our doors every day. Friends or lovers whose demands for love and loyalty conceal toxic motives, or a family member whose affection is conditional on our silence about our experiences, our options, or our true selves. Sometimes the demons scuttle into our brains even though we try to block them out. Sometimes they arrive in disguise and we welcome them into our lives again and again without realizing. And sometimes we recognize them, but we welcome them in just the same. Though we might think of magic powers as a way to transform external circumstances, they can be even stronger when used for protection against the negative internal demons caused by the world around us and the people in it. Oh, itchy nose. Recognizing and then eliminating these damaging inner forces is classic magic banishment. Banishment is also about empowering yourself so that you can stop those demons from plaguing you. More than learning to say no, although that's an important skin skill we'll be talking about. This type of banishment is a holistic form of self-care. The trick, as with many forms of magic, is to find balance. Self-care can easily turn into self-indulgence, which can become a wellspring of negative energy. And recognizing the difference between the two is heavy lifting of the banishment practice. For example, sitting on the couch eating ice cream every day might feel good because your life is stressful and ice cream is delicious, but it's not a good long-term solution. No matter how blissed out you are on sugar, a voice in your head is telling you to take a walk, read a book, or at least invite a friend over to share the ice cream with you. But that voice gets quieter in more difficult situations, especially when your toxic feelings of self-defeat and worthlessness come swirling up. Your adversaries and inner demons will come for you. There's little magic that will change that. This chapter will help you confront them, protect yourself against their powers, be strong enough to fight back, and learn to grieve. <laughs> what? Can't eat ice cream all day, every day? What? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. You can teach yourself to rise above the mob when pitchforks come knock at your door, and you can learn to calm the demons when they rise inside you. The witches of fairy tales may have been tricked by those who hated them, but real witches get to defeat their own demons. Expelling social toxicity, how to cure allergy to people who suck. Hmm, do we have enough time for this section? I don't know. Calming the demons is harder than it seems. It, well, calming the demons, it depends on the demon, whether it needs to be calmed or whether it needs to be knocked back into a room and locked away. Not that I have any experience doing that. I was an asshole. Well, really, I I got fed up. And um, I got fed up and I locked it in a in a closet and locked the door and left it there for many years. I eventually let her out and her demeanor is a lot different now. Me either, I have battle scars from my demons but I have come out on top. Though I slip now and then. 
Well, hopefully these banishment spells will help you when, in times when you slip. I think it is wise that we chat for the last 10 minutes and then we'll talk about banishment. Oh, come on. Expelling to social toxicity. Yeah, it's basically how to avoid people or how to end relationships. We're calling out social toxicity. I'll talk about all of that tomorrow. What is your experience dealing with demons? Dealing with brain weasels, as it were. Most of my fighting is done with medication. But medication kind of makes it so that I can actually like see and I'm not drowning and you know, yeah. Mm. But not ending them. I hope cohabitate with my demon. Her name is Ambi. This is just because, this is because of my whole monster rancher thing. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. But there's a lot to be said for cohabitating with your demons. That's like the goal of shadow working, right? <clears throat> Is to be able to cohabitate or demolish the demon entirely. Isn't that 2020, the whole year been avoiding relationships? I don't know about that. I have been trying to maintain my relationships in 2020. I have all art projects with her talking shit. She embodies my over ambition fueled, my negative self-talk. Oh. I have BPD along with variety of other issues. No meds because I can't afford medical. So I have a support system that is amazing and a hubby that knows the signs of going downhill. That's good. I'm sorry that that's something that you have to fight, um, but I'm really glad that you have support. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I have um, disassociative identity disorder. Well, so there's a lot to be said for this, but um, I had a minor demon living in me that made my life very complicated. Um, she woke up when I was 13 during a particularly, um, she's my tulpa. She's one of, she's my primary tulpa. I have also removed myself from my triggers, which is wonderful. I mean, like, how do you explain to, like, law enforcement that a demon made you do it? Like, how do you do that? And not sound like a crazy person? So, it's by science standards, it's easier to say that I had an altar. She used to take the driving wheel, you know, the steering wheel, um, quite often. Which means I had, I was losing time, which means I was, um, I was paranoid as hell. There were times where there were conversations that I wasn't present for. So she knew them, but I did not. I was told by my therapist that BPD and DID are the same thing. What? Just different spectrum levels. 
Um, in that they're both a mental illness, maybe. That's really weird. I don't know how I, I, I can't process that. I had to stop worrying about sounding like a crazy person. I have like four alternative avatars. I call them Terras, like how my name is Tantara. Right on. Um, it's, how do I word this? For me, it's a fine line that I'm dancing. Like how much do I talk about and um, how much, I mean, I've come a long, long way and meditation has been a really big part of that. Um, yeah, meditation is a really big part of that. And I'm hoping that the meditations that I release in the next year will be helpful in similar ways for you guys. My favorite is M.A. She runs most of the assaulting and gets me to doctor's appointments on time. Nice. Oh, adulting. Okay. Cool. Cool. Having tulpas who can like help you out in times of crisis, no matter how small the crisis is one of the benefits of having, of making tulpas or avatars, depending on how you think of them. Like, are they sentient on their own? Do they have their own thought processes? Can you be surprised by them? Or are they just another skin that you put on? Right? Like, mm, I might do a, a whole like video on the differences between like altars and tulpas which is a real weird and fine line and might make me sound like a crazy person how do i explain these things without sounding like a crazy person that tulpas are not always friendly. And I think I made mine, well, she originally talked back to me when I was like six but she actually woke up um, when I was 13 during a particularly nasty day. My avatars are well-developed skins. Oh. Each live in a different journal and have certain areas they are in charge of. They also collaborate, support other avatars. That's wonderful. That's, that's wonderful. I've done a fair amount of research on DID and it barely scratches the surface of what's really happening inside. I find it fascinating. It isn't a crazy or not crazy sort of deal. It needs to be talked about to encourage education. Maybe just keep the facts handy and explain it tactfully, but if people don't want to listen or write you off as crazy, then that is a them problem.
Well, it is, sorry, I zoned out again. It is 11 o'clock. Thank you all for joining me. Oh, I didn't realize that bipolar was a dissociative disorder. Maybe that's what sh she meant. Oh, okay. I'm happy to talk about it so I feel less crazy. Yeah. Right on. Um, I'm going to continue this conversation on Discord. For now, I'm going to end this uh, stream. Thank you. If you enjoyed this stream at any point, please hit the like button. <clears throat> if you would like to do to see what the rest of this book is like, please subscribe and uh, maybe even ring that bell just to see if YouTube is actually going to notify you. And I will catch you guys on the flip side. Oh, borderline person. Oh, borderline. That's interesting. All right. Catch you guys later.